Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining me online. Today, we're going to begin a brand new series on the life of one of the most compelling and captivating characters in all of Scripture. His name was simply John, but most people probably know him as John the Baptist. John was the forerunner to Jesus, the one who came to prepare the way for the Messiah. In fact, the story of Jesus begins with the story of John, literally. I mean, all four Gospels start off with the story of John. And surprisingly, his is one of the most least taught on lives in the entire Bible. And that's surprising because he appears in 23 chapters of Scripture. The last words of the Old Testament prophesied his coming. He was a fiery preacher uh, filled with the Holy Spirit. And if that wasn't enough, Jesus once said of him in Matthew 11, verse 11, Truly I tell you, among those born of women, there has not arisen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Let me read that again. Truly I tell you, among those born of women, that's everybody, right? I mean, nobody has been born that wasn't born of a woman. No one has arisen that is greater than John the Baptist. This is just an astounding statement, isn't it? I mean, that's the kind of statement that ought to make us stop in our tracks as we're reading the Gospels. According to Jesus, John was the greatest person ever born to that point in history. Now, that is a life worth noting, don't you think? I mean, when Jesus says someone is the greatest person ever born, doesn't that sound like someone whose life we ought to examine and possibly emulate? I think so. So for the next few weeks, we are going to be lifted up by the life of John the Baptist, the forerunner of Jesus. Before we get to John's life and ministry, though, we have to talk about the unusual circumstances surrounding his birth. The story of John's birth is told in tandem with the birth of Jesus in Luke chapter 1. Uh, you might want to open up a Bible and follow along because this is a sprawling story spanning 80 verses. That's right, Luke chapter 1 is 80 verses long. And Luke begins by introducing us to a Jewish couple named Zechariah and Elizabeth in verse 5. When Herod was king of Judea, there was a Jewish priest named Zechariah. He was a member of the priestly order of Abijah, and his wife Elizabeth was also from the priestly line of Aaron. Zechariah and Elizabeth were righteous in God's eyes, careful to obey all of the Lord's commandments and regulations. They had no children because Elizabeth was unable to conceive, and they were both very old. Zechariah and Elizabeth were good, godly people. In fact, Zechariah was a priest in the order of Abijah. And twice a year, the sons of Abijah served for seven days in the temple. They were in charge of morning and evening sacrifices. And so there were 14 opportunities for someone to light the incense on the sacred altar in the holy place of the temple. The holy place was the second most sacred place on earth. And the altar of incense was located just two feet from the Holy of Holies, which was the most sacred place in the world. God himself dwelt within the Holy of Holies. And every morning, the priests would gather and they would draw lots. And then every afternoon, they would do the same thing. Each time, the winner got to enter the holy place and light the incense on the altar. And the privilege was considered so special that no priest was allowed to win the lottery twice. Only once in your life would you get the chance to enter the holy place. Only once. And by the time this story is written, 
Zechariah was well along in years. He had been a priest for a very long time and still hadn't had the opportunity to enter the temple. The Bible doesn't say exactly how old he and Elizabeth were, but it's safe to assume they were well beyond childbearing years. I would say at least 50, probably much older than that. And by this time, most eligible priests were many years his junior. Most of his peers had already entered the temple. He had waited his whole life for this opportunity. And finally, his moment arrived. Finally, verse 8 says, he was chosen. His lot was drawn. And upon entering the holy place, Zechariah began burning incense on the altar. Everything was going according to plan until something astonishing happened. The Bible says in verse 11, While Zechariah was in the sanctuary, an angel of the Lord appeared to him. Zechariah was understandably stunned and overwhelmed with fear at the sight of an angel. But then the angel spoke and says in verse 13 and following, Don't be afraid, Zechariah. God has heard your prayer. Your wife Elizabeth will give you a son, and you are to name him John. You will have great joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the eyes of the Lord. Now, still astonished, Zechariah couldn't believe his eyes and ears. And so he he asks the angel in verse 18, How can I be sure this will happen? I'm an old man now, and my wife is also well along in years. Now, generally, I don't think it's a good idea to question the word of an angel of the Lord, because this angel seems to get a little bit upset. He snaps back at Zechariah in verse 19 and 20. I am Gabriel. I stand in the very presence of God. It was he who sent me to bring you this good news. But now, since you didn't believe what I said... You will be silent and unable to speak until the child is born. For my words will certainly be fulfilled at the proper time. And immediately, Zechariah lost his voice. He wanted a sign of some kind to know that this was was really going to happen, and he certainly got one. He immediately could not speak. And he had to finish out the rest of his temple service for that week by making signs and gestures to his fellow priests. But eventually, the week ended, and he was able to return home to his beloved wife, Elizabeth. And true to the angel's word, Elizabeth became pregnant. Now fast forward six months. Elizabeth, who now has a visible baby bump, receives a visit from her much younger cousin, Mary, who is also miraculously pregnant, with the baby Jesus. And at the sound of Mary's voice, Elizabeth's baby kicks. And Elizabeth is filled with the Holy Spirit. And she says in verse 42, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leapt for joy. Now Mary, who herself is three months pregnant at this point, stays with Zachariah and Elizabeth for another three months until Elizabeth's baby is born. And when the baby was eight days old, all of their neighbors and family gathered together for the circumcision and naming ceremony. This was a special event and moment uh, in their culture. And the family wanted to name the baby Zachariah after his father. But Elizabeth insisted, no, His name is John. And when an argument breaks out, Zechariah motions for a writing tablet, and he writes, his name is John. And the moment he writes it, the second he sets down his pencil, he began to speak again. And he praised God and prophesied over his newborn son. Now there is so much to unpack in this miraculous birth story. And I couldn't possibly cover all of it in a single sermon. But with the time that I've got left, as long as you're hanging in there with me, 
I just want to highlight three lessons that Christians, young and old, from every epoch of time, can take from the story of John's birth. The first is a lesson in prayer. Prayer plays a significant role in this story, but if you blink, you'll miss it. When Zechariah lit the incense within the holy place, smoke would rise from the altar uh, and, and escape the temple through a hole in the ceiling. And the Bible says in verse 11, while the incense was being burned, a great crowd out, stood outside praying. So when the other priests and, and worshipers waiting outside saw the smoke rising from within the temple, they would begin to pray. The smoke rising symbolized the prayers of God's people wafting heavenward. And while the crowd prayed outside, Zechariah prayed inside. And what do you suppose he was praying for? We get a pretty big clue when the angel Gabriel says to him in verse 13, don't be afraid, Zechariah. God has heard your prayer. Your wife, Elizabeth, will give you a son. Standing inside the holy place, Zechariah was as close to God as he would ever get. So he took the opportunity to, to pray and to ask God for the one thing he wanted most, a son. Zechariah and Elizabeth were people of prayer. And against all odds, God answered their prayers. You know, in Jewish culture, having children was seen as a blessing from the Lord. In fact, Scripture tells us that children are a blessing from the Lord. And the more children they had, the better. So my guess is that Zechariah and Elizabeth had been praying for children since the day they got married. And that's a very long time. Most people would have given up, but not Zechariah. He kept praying. Even in his old age, standing in the temple, he took this opportunity to pray again for a son. Prayer is an essential component of the Christian life. God wants us to connect with him and commune with him through prayer. Not just on occasion, but persistently and passionately. You know, the Apostle Paul says simply in 1 Thessalonians 5.17, Never stop praying. Bill Hybels tells an interesting, uh, about an interesting experience after a baptism service at their church, Willow Creek Community Church up in Chicago. He writes, I bumped into a woman in the stairwell who was crying. Uh, I thought this was a little odd since the, the service was so joyful. And I asked her if she was all right. She said, no, I'm struggling. She said, my mom was baptized today. I prayed for her every day for almost 20 years. The reason I'm crying is that I came this close to giving up. I prayed for her. And at the five-year mark, I said, who needs this? God isn't listening. At the 10-year mark, I said, why am I wasting my breath? At the 15-year mark, I said, this is absurd. After 19 years, I said, I'm just a fool. But I just kept praying. Even with weak faith, I kept praying. And then she gave her life to Christ, and she was baptized today. I will never doubt the power of prayer again. I imagine that's exactly how Zechariah felt when his prayers were finally answered. You know, God answers prayer in his own way and in his own time. Sometimes God provides an answer immediately. Other times we have to be patient and persistent in prayer. But God is always listening. So we should never stop praying. Great things happen when God's people pray. And furthermore, the story of John's birth also highlights the importance of praise. 
If you couldn't speak for nine whole months, what would you say when you finally got your voice back? What would be the first words out of your mouth? That's a good question. I don't know the answer to that question. I haven't been in that situation before, so I'm not sure what I would say. But I do know what Zechariah said and did. The Bible says again in verse 63, Instantly, Zechariah could speak again, and he began praising God. I'm sure Zechariah was praising God just for the fact that he got his voice back, but also because of the birth of his beautiful baby son and because of God's faithfulness in keeping his promises. Soon thereafter, the Bible says that Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit, and he gave a prophecy saying in verse 68 and following, Praise the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has visited and redeemed his people. He has sent us a mighty Savior from the royal line of his servant David, just as he promised through his holy prophets long ago. Zechariah saw all that God was doing in the world and in their lives through Mary and through Jesus, and he praised God for it. He praised God for the coming Messiah, for redemption, for salvation, for the forgiveness of sins. Zechariah lived in desperate times. Israel was under Roman occupation. Taxes were high. Income was low. Slavery was commonplace. Death was all around them. But through the darkness, Zechariah saw God's tender mercies breaking over the horizon. And of course, Zechariah wasn't the only one who praised God. Elizabeth praised God as well. As soon as she found out that she was pregnant while her husband was still mute, she exclaimed in verse 25, how kind the Lord is. Praise is a vital part of a life surrendered to God. Praise gives credit where credit is due. You know, David set the right example when he wrote in Psalm 145 verses 2 and 3, I will praise you every day. Yes, I will praise you forever. Great is the Lord. He is most worthy of praise. God is worthy of praise because of both who he is and what he has done. God is full of glory, greatness, wisdom, power, mercy, might, goodness, faithfulness, and, and so much more. And he's the one who saves us who keeps his promises, who pardons sin, who brings redemption, who gives life, breath, and all things. And the best part about praising God is that you can do it anywhere, anytime. You don't have to, to travel to the temple in Jerusalem in order to praise God or even go to church on Sunday. Elizabeth and Zechariah praised God in their own home. You can praise God in, in your car while listening to Christian radio and belting out the lyrics. You can praise God in the morning just by jumping out of bed and shouting, This is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Praise anytime, anytime that you give glory and credit to God. You join Elizabeth and Zechariah in praising the Lord. And when you make the praise of God, an integral part of your life, it'll transform your heart and mind. And finally, on top of prayer and praise, the story of John's birth also puts a strong emphasis on purpose. God had a specific purpose and plan for John's life. The angel Gabriel expresses that purpose to Zechariah when he appeared to him in the temple. Back in, in verse 13, again, he says, Your wife Elizabeth will give you a son, and you are to name him John. You will have great joy and gladness. Uh, many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the eyes of the Lord. He must never touch wine or other alcoholic drinks. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before his birth, and he will turn many Israelites to the Lord their God. He will be a man with the spirit and power of Elijah. He will prepare the people for the coming of the Lord. He will turn the hearts 
of the fathers to their children and will cause those who are rebellious to accept the wisdom of the godly. You know, portions of this, in fact, almost the entire last half uh, of the angel Gabriel's words come directly from the prophecy of Malachi in Malachi chapter 4, a prophecy made 400 years earlier. Malachi, who was the last of the Old Testament prophets, predicted a prophet like Elijah who would herald the coming of Christ. And that prophet was John the Baptist. God had a plan for John the Baptist, for John's life, 400 plus years before he was born. And then nine months later, at, after his birth, Zechariah reiterates the words of Gabriel, as well as the words of the prophet Isaiah, who came even before Micah, prophesying over his newborn son in verses 76 and 77, And you, my little son, will be called the prophet of the Most High, because you will prepare the way for the Lord. You will tell his people how to find salvation through forgiveness of their sins. Clearly, God had a very specific purpose for John, a purpose planned long, long before his birth. And the truth is, God has a purpose and plan for your life, too. And the search for the meaning of life has, has puzzled people for thousands of years, primarily because we typically start in the wrong place, ourselves. And we ask self-centered questions like, what do I want to be, and what should I do with my life, what are my goals, my ambitions, my dreams for my future? But focusing on ourselves will never reveal our life's purpose. Contrary to many books, movies, and self-help seminars, you don't discover your life's purpose by looking within yourself. You didn't create yourself, so you can't possibly tell yourself what you were created for. The purpose of your life is far greater and grander than your own personal fulfillment or your peace of mind or even your happiness. It's greater than your family or your career or even your wildest dreams and ambitions. If you want to know why you were placed on this planet, you must begin with God. You were born by God's purposes and for God's purposes. In fact, God's purpose for your life is not all that different from God's purpose for John's life. Put simply, John's purpose was to be filled with the Holy Spirit and to tell people how to find salvation and the forgiveness of their sins and to prepare the people for the coming of Christ, to prepare people for Jesus. And God's purpose for your life and mine includes those very same things. Over the next few weeks, we're going to discover how we can live out God's purpose for our lives, the way that John lived out God's purpose for his life. The story of John's birth is an inspiring and intriguing tale that highlights the power of persistent prayer the importance of praising the Lord our God, and the value of knowing and living God's purpose for your life. Of course, this is just the beginning of John's story. I hope that you'll stick with me for the next three weeks as we continue to examine one of the greatest lives ever lived. In the meantime, I want to encourage you to follow the example of John's parents. Never stop praying. Never stop praising. And if you are a parent, I, I want to encourage you, urge you to do exactly what Zachariah did and regularly remind your children that God has a purpose and plan for their lives. And if you're in need of prayer or, or if you need help discovering God's purpose for your life, please reach out to me. You can, you can message us on Facebook or send an email through our website at bloominggrove.org or you can just leave a comment on this video. In the meantime, let's pray together. Lord God, thank you for sending John to be the forerunner of Jesus.
Thank you for including his story in scripture and using it to remind us of the importance of prayer and praise. May we all seek to know and live your purpose for our lives and follow in the footsteps of John, paving the way for Jesus in our world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you again for joining me today. I hope you have a blessed week, and I'll see you next Sunday.